evening, uh, everyone, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here on the inaugural webinar of the uh, Academia of Minimal Access Surgical Oncology. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. So uh, I have a very esteemed uh, panel here, and before we start, uh, let me just make this disclosure. I've been in touch with them and accept Dr. Jagdish Gowda and Dr. Som Shekhar, who have now an, uh, have an isolated floor in their own facility, and Professor Vijay Kumar also, who have been dealing with the COVID patients uh, once in a while. Everybody else is by and large working in a practically COVID negative environment. So, uh, and uh, we have had a very, very uh, good lectures uh, regarding the laparoscopy, regarding the triage. So, I thought it will be good if we can discuss about the practical aspects. And for that, we invited the champions uh, for learning to know from them as to what are the practical issues on the ground and how are they trying to circumvent it right, and speed in their path. So, uh, the first uh, issue is, of course, we have the preoperative press testing protocol mentioned by Professor Vijay Kumar. Uh, can I uh, ask uh, Dr. Sandeep Naik, Dr. Sandeep, are you also doing the same amount of preoperative testing or is there any difference and how are you spacing the testing in your patients vis-a-vis -vis the surgery? Present, we are only for based test. And generally, we do a day or two prior to the surgery. And if it is negative, we go ahead and continue with the surgery. So we are not doing CT scans. We are, uh, in fact, the reason why we are not doing is, in fact, I suggested to my radiologist, they said it would be difficult for them to run all the cases through CT scans because of uh, the load that they face. So that, that, that's what they that, uh, you know, frankly told me. And then we said, OK, fine, we are not uh, going ahead. So as far as the, uh, the, this is the only test we are doing as of now. OK, please. So uh, may I know from Dr. Saklani, are you also doing the same? And are you admitting the patients? How long early are you admitting the patients before the surgical procedure? Because the protocol says that you must observe the patient for at least about 8 to 10 days before the surgical procedure is undertaken, whether you do it on OPD basis through video consultation or whether you do keep the patient in-house and monitor them for symptoms of ILI. So what's your uh, pro pro protocol? Do you admit them beforehand, say five days beforehand, and do all the testing? No, we follow the hospital policy, so we don't have to think much about it. What we do is, for our symptomatic patients, 48 hours before that, uh, the RT-PCR is done. Uh, they don't do for PAC or any other thing because we don't. We'll have to do contact tracing if they come positive. The report comes back the night, and we admit them the next day for surgery. And once they have surgery, advanced recovery, we try to send them home on day three. So that's the best way that we are following so far, because that is the hospital policy. So any so other thing. Okay, so your hospital hospital policy does not dictate. Uh, thorough testing and waiting before the uh, patients are operated, is it? No. no. Okay. And uh, since you are in the hotspot, Mumbai, uh, is demographics making a difference? Are you isolating the patients or they get isolated at the screening table itself? Uh, no, I think uh, for uh, wherever there is acute care setting, there are three parts of the hospital. So the first part is where people who are unscreened, people who are there, which need to be screened. The second area where they where if they turn positive, that's the second area there. And the third area would be the clean area. So actually only one third of beds are available to us. So the number of beds are so limited, but all the areas are clearly isolated. So there's no mix. Uh, so. so can I request, Sir Professor Vijay Kumar, Sir, you elaborately mentioned about that testing policy and it is very understandable that different hospital settings will have different limitations. And of course the different COVID load and also whether it's COVID negative or positive. So what should be the optimal strategy, uh, the minimum optimal strategy for uh, testing the patients before surgery for any cancer? So, Before I directly answer, we'll have to know certain tests are not available at all in our country. Yeah. Artificially made, I would say, by the ICMR, not allowing uh, to be done as a routine. Whereas in a state like Delhi, by, a by the 
magistrate, they are telling every admitted patient has to go through RTPC. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. different states have got different policies and central coming into the picture here, ICMR is trying to say that RTPCR needs to be done only for A, B, C, D. They are given the indications. Wherein, if you look at it, elective cases are not at all there. If you, in fact, see the indication, there is only one column called others, which you have to tick, and then only you have to upload them. And every RTPCR done in this country by either private lab or by any government lab has to be intimated to ICMR. The moment it is positive, it has to be, of course, it is going to come to everybody's knowledge, but we are allowed to specially intimate to the surveillance officer of that particular district. These are certain issues which make many people uh, take a back, back seat to openly do this and inform them. Having said that, in our country, with all these mixed issues, every institution is doing their own policy. And as I understand, most of them are doing RTPCR, whether it's a formal or informal. They are doing it, and then only they are taking it. But the problem I feel in this, scientifically speaking, when it is negative, I am really worried because one third of the times the positive can be negative. So that means every third patient who we are taking as negative may not be negative. We should not become casual with all the patients just because you have done RTPC. That is why I am insisting that treat or consider every patient who is now coming to us as though they are positive and protect ourselves by preventive measures rather than doing an RT-PCR or IGM and say it is negative and be casual about it. Okay, and do you think uh, one should go ahead only on the basis of RT-PCR? Of course, serology is, is, is uh, present at some places, not present at some other places. Or do you recommend RT-PCR and some waiting time in the hospital? I don't recommend RT-PCR at all if you ask me personally. Okay. Or okay. You're Everybody is uh, positive and take precautions, I'm telling, again and again. Because okay. RT-PCR, if, if it is positive, it is useful not to do surgery, agree. Because those patients, the morbidity and mortality is considerably high, and so we may. Whereas if you are looking at this, this triage to take them in, that's not the right way of doing. That's my personal view on the subject after reviewing it. But most of the centers are doing at our eyes. Yeah. I would just mention that in our hospital, the protocol is that we do the RT-PCR on the operative, on the OPD setting on, say, day one. We send them home, do the video consultation for four days, call them back on day five, do the serology and the HRCT test, then keep them admitted for three days, and then we operate them on the day eight. Somehow, uh, if, if you look at the entire uh, protocol, perhaps it gives, I've been discussing with Soam yesterday, it gives about 96% accuracy of being sure that the patient was COVID negative, but then I'm sure. Little, little louder, little louder. Okay. So, Rajesh, but only thing in Bombay, if they go back, yeah. the risk of community transmission is very high. Right. So, right. Of course, of course. so that's why we cannot send them back again. Oh, hmm. you cannot send them back? Plus, I'm sure the kind of workload that you have, uh, I, I, I understand the, the various limitations that you will have. And uh, therefore, one policy may not actually hold well for all the hospitals in the country. Situations are very diverse, government regulations are very diverse. So let's uh, go on to the next uh, important issue. Dr. Soam did mention his and showed his consent chart. I, I, because I've also been involved in some bit of policy making in my hospital. Consents are a big issue and despite the fact that the patients of cancer will, if the doctor advises, invariably they will give the consent. What are the major consent issues or the changed consent issues uh, I would request Dr. Jagannath Dixit and Dr. Gowda to comment as to what are the different, what's the difference in the consent that you are taking now? Dr. Dixit, please. Yeah, so, uh, sir, we have made, a, you know, one of the important consent form and, uh, you know, this pre-anesthetic checkup, uh, you know, rather than taking it just day before the uh, surgery, the consent, we take it almost two or three days prior to the surgery. And it is clearly explains uh, that, you know, that uh, risk involved. Suppose, uh, you know, that uh, false uh, negative rate and false positive rate of the testing. And it also inclo includes the, you know, some of the healthcare workers and how the protection we need uh, to take and all that. I think these measures we do. Dr. Gorda, your comment, please. 
Yeah, um, initially, um, we, we, we have a uh, COVID floor in our hospital. And another hospital, we have a separate building uh, where there is a COVID patients are there. So what uh, we do is we, we left it to the physicians as a first line um, interaction with the patient. And um, because as per as, as what you told, you know, eight days, seven days, which is not possible um, with our center, we, we explain them that uh, most of the Telangana government doesn't allow COVID RT-PCR. Whereas for robotic and lab, we have made certain arrangements. Uh, with this is actually what Vijay Kumar is informal. It's not. Uh, it's not uh, as the government uh, restrictions. We also do it for some patients. We have sent to Karnataka and we did. So we tell the patients okay. open surgery. We are not doing artificial here, and we have one floor of COVID, few COVID patients, and we tell them about the transmission and the special consent, and we tell the OT, OT staff, and the higher risk of uh, surgery in case like we had two patients later on turned out to be positive. So we don't know which patient is positive, which patient is negative. We inform them the possibility of COVID positivity and uh, uh, high risk consent. These two things only we tell them. And our health workers also so we inform all the risk factors. Great. I think you have covered almost everything. And what my, in my own uh, opinion, I think two things, three things were very, very important. Apart from the fact that they might have higher rate of complications if they turn out for positive later on, despite the intense screening or pre-operative testing protocol. I think in the private sector, it becomes important to mention to them that the cost is going to be high because not only the testing, the PPEs, uh, the cost is by and large borne by the patient. So the cost is getting higher. And of course, there is always a risk for contracting uh, COVID from the hospital. And I think it's this particular risk is going to become more important as and as we go ahead with the COVID era. Uh, because more obviously all patients stay in the hospital for at least about eight to nine days or ten days. I'm, I'm not talking about colonic and the rectal resections, but most patients will stay in the hospital for about eight days, and there is a possibility. And this actually happened in one of the hospitals in the north, and there were issues about it. So uh, before I before I uh, go on to the other controversial things, particularly in the last two three days, you must have seen everybody must have seen lots of uh, you know. Uh, uh, coverages from various articles and controversies and discussions about the HCQ prophylaxis. May I request uh, Dr. Subramaneshwar Rao and Dr. Devinder Pari, uh, have you taken HCQ prophylaxis? <laughs> all your HCQ prophylaxis, and what's your point of view? No, 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 not as yet. I've been contemplating, discussing. Each day I have a different opinion about myself. Be very honest. I'm not done. Done it as it. I don't know what I will be doing. Honestly, I don't know whether whether I, I should be taking it or not. Whether I should be advising to the uh, rest of the staff. I'm not convinced either way. To be very honest, I'm confused about uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine prophylaxis. Me and my wife keep discussing each day whether to take or not. So, so we are we are we are going. But day after day, you are not started as yet. Okay, very understandable. In fact, that's the situation with most uh, healthcare workers. Dr. Parikh, your comment? Uh, at, at our place in Ahmedabad, we have a lot of corona positive patients, and as a issue protocol, our hospital has started two months back. Every single healthcare professional is taking 400 milligram. So, it, uh, what we are taking is 800 milligram loading dose, and then 400 milligram weekly dose and we are continuing with the same dose at this point of time. All the senior members of our team are under underwent cardiac uh, status evaluation before taking HCQ prophylaxis. But at our center at HCG Cancer Center Ahmedabad, we are taking HCQ prophylaxis. Okay, so let's just have a very quick uh, uh, one word answer from almost all the esteemed panelists. Uh, Dr. Nayak? Yes or no? No. Okay, so Prophylaxis, yes or no? Uh, I, I have taken, in our institution, it was the institution of policy, we took it. Uh, uh, it's very difficult. See, if we had a randomized control trial, this question would never have happened. This controversy is because there is no conclusive evidence even to the tune of level 2B. We don't have it. Uh, so, uh, the only thing I would look at the other way around, uh, what is the harm in taking HCQ, uh, the cardiac issues, GI and other, are not well confirmed, confounded. 
Uh, now that we have four studies from India, so I take it up to individual people to balance the complication. Dr. Dixit? Uh, sir, actually, you know, I tell you frankly, I started taking the tablet and I continued for two or three weeks. Then the ICM suddenly said that no point and better to discontinue. So I stopped almost and it's a surprise that after two or three days, so, and there is a great indication that probably I am thinking to restart now. And the, But I had one consultation with one of the rheumatologists and immunologists, a good friend of mine. Uh, but what he was advocating is the, the lesser dosage, probably uh, because we are also stressed because of the surgery and other things. Probably none of us, we have got an annual pickup of ECG and echo. Probably our uh, friend was advocating, you know, we can take a, uh, almost half the dose. Rather than going for 800 mg, take it 400 mg and uh, continuously, then on a weekly basis, go for half the dose. So yeah. probably that also uh, might be going to give the equal result as the full dose. Dr. Rudra? Yeah, uh, as per the max policy, I am taking uh, since uh, March actually. And uh, after this uh, latest ICMR report beyond eight weeks, uh, I'm going to take maybe more than uh, four weeks. Dr. Saklani? Uh, no, no. Okay. Sir, Professor Vijay Kumar? Uh, are you there? Okay. Mute. Sir, so, uh, so are you there? Sorry. I, I'm sorry. Are you muted? Uh -huh. I am, no, no. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, in the house is divided. Almost about half of the people have taken, half of the people have not taken. In fact, there was this revised guideline from ICMR yesterday, which has actually advocated. Uh, the grounds may not be very well established. It is obviously not the basis of any well designed studies. The house is divided, and so is the uh, uh, you know, kind of opinion all over the world. The ICMR has advised, and at our own institute, we kind of procured a lot of HCQ, gave it to almost all the healthcare workers. I myself took the first dose, loading dose of 400 milligram BD on the day one. Next week, you know, I got scared, so I started with 200 milligram for three weeks. Then I got some literature, so I got confident again, so I'm on 400. <laughs> okay, that's the status. So, okay, so I think it's divided, and we don't have an answer. Uh, regarding the PPE, of course, uh, there are lots of uh, you know, variations which are available. I think let's not go into the details, but I'll show you certain pictures. And you can see one on the extreme left, which is white, which I started with, did three procedures and kind of gave it up and then came into these universal proportions. May I have a quick, quick Yes or, or you uh, just one word answer. Perfect or optimal PP? Uh, I, I, it should it be a combination of a perfect headgear and an optimal gown, or a perfect headgear and a perfect gown, meaning thereby that you have to cover the entire body. What's the opinion of the house, uh, Dr. Som? None of the PP are good for uh, head and neck cover. Perfect cover for the head and an optimal gown is fine rather than the other way around. Great, exactly. So, and uh, Dr. Gowda? Uh, I use a half, half face uh, respirator with uh, goggles on my specs and the uh, PPE for robotic and laparoscopy and a routine gown for open surgery. Okay, yeah, great. So, I, th I think uh, most of the people uh, would now agree that you know almost about one to one and a half months down the line into the experience, we have realized that the full PPE, uh, the kind of the hazmat suit, was very uncomfortable to wear. And on the top of that, we were wearing gowns. So I have myself now reduced down to the universal precautions which we used to take for the HIV and hepatitis patients. But along with that, a very good idea. One of the problems with the headgear that I have shown here, which comes from 3M, which perhaps most of the cancer surgeons are using, uh, was that it does protect you, but it is a kind of a respirator and it does not put, protect the other person whom you are talking to. When you inhale, then it tends to come out. When you inhale, it gets the filter there. So this new, you can see the new, this kind of uh, attachment is now available in the market, also not a good quantity. So you can actually attach it over your respirator and prevent it. Uh, doc, Dr. Rajesh, we are not seeing the picture. You have to share your screen. You have to share the screen. Share screen. Oh, sorry. I think the screen must have been shared. 
No, no, it is not that. Oh, I'm so sorry. We are only seeing ourselves. Okay. This is the one that I was talking about. It's kind of bad. Are you getting to see that? Yeah, yeah, see. Yes. Yeah. Sure. sure. Now we are seeing, yeah. Okay, so this kind of attachment is now possible uh, available from the 3 app, and that actually prevents uh, problems uh, to the person you are talking while you are operating. So it just interacts both ways. So uh, coming to the theater environment, it has already been uh, discussed and presented by Dr. Somshaker, the important components, uh, I'm not going to list them again, but you know, temperature has to be less than 21, humidity less than 65, air exchanges have been discussed, minimum cost of pressure has been discussed. I would want to know from the uh, champions as to how much have you been able to handle in your theater? Have you been able to leave apart the negative pressure? Because negative pressure is only exceptionally available in Indian theaters. I've also been trying to ask many people. That's not negative pressure, that's not possible. But everything else has that been possible, or can you compromise on that thing? Dr. Rao, please. We, we have been. Uh... Notable? Yeah. No, no, no. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, now no. better, now better. So, yeah, the internet is very unstable, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. yeah. yeah please. Yeah. You are audible? Yes, yes, yes. We can hear. Yeah. See, I would say that, that we are following most of it at least, if not everything. There may be a bit of compromise sometimes, but but most of the operation room part of it, we we follow everything. But the PPE for the surgeons only when when we uh, suspect and then investigate, only then we are actually using PPE. Oh, so you're not using PPE otherwise? The headgear is used, but the rest of it is it's regular grounds. Oh, okay. So that essentially no. means that you are not uh, treating everybody as a COVID suspect. You are uh, depending on the testing. Correct. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dikshit, any comments? Correct. Uh, the major uh, problem is that uh, whenever we do a surgery which uh, amounts to almost about more than three to four hours, probably the face shield, especially the face shield, and uh, whenever we sit in the robotic console, you know, the, you know, it cannot recognize unless you remove the face shield and put your head and inside and then the instruments will start working. So that is the greatest problem. So we are having a 3M mask with a respirator with a cartridge which is, can be detachable. And also, uh, you know, that uh, whatever the spectacles already we are having, probably that will be good. But the face shield is the one which comes in the way. And also, whenever we keep a 21 and 3 degrees centigrade uh, temperature inside, a lot of uh, you know, uh, suffocation and then a lot of sweating. And even the area of contact of the nose, especially where the 3M mask fits, probably we need to have a important uh, because the sweating is really disturbing. But we need to wear a regular mask over that uh, to put a 3M mask because this, uh, you know, it's a very uncomfortable. Uh, I think. Uh, Sometimes we really have to remove two, three minutes and then take a deep breath and start to restart the surgery. So it's a, a really, I, I want to, you know, know the experience of other surgeons because it's, we are not used to that. So we are really, you know, it's not a very comfortable for us. Yeah, yeah. I, in fact, uh, that's perhaps been the experience with most people. Uh, Dr. Uh, Rudra, any comments? Yeah. Uh, uh... At our place, we always use the full face uh, respirator uh, okay. from 3M with okay. the 300 uh, cartridges. Right. And uh, we use, like you, the commonest universal precaution HIV uh, yeah. for the uh, shoe cover and the thing. But uh, one thing we are doing is very simple is after you wear that helmet, uh, one of the uh, OT seats that we 
put in the uh, uh, on the patient uh, is taken with a, there is a uh, there is a tape uh, with a adhesive tape uh, uh, attached. So you take out the paper and you can just uh, put it on your uh, uh, the full face respirator in the face. And make it uh, completely uh, covering your neck uh, on the back, and then you put the gown. So what happens is, from the head to uh, toe, everything gets covered, uh, and the neck is completely covered around the uh, around the uh, um, uh, over that uh, helmet. So we found it uh, very effective to cover everything of your body. Okay, so that's great. That's a good uh, indigenous modification. Uh, uh, Dr. Parikh and Dr. Nath, can you comment? Uh, I have one comment that uh, once Dr. Somsekar sir has also mentioned that in OT it has to be a protocol that all the participants shall have same level of protection. Yeah. So if uh, one of the colleague is using a uh, valve respirator and another one is using simple respirator then uh, using simple respirator is having more risk compared to someone using wild respirator. So at our uh, hospital, couple of surgeons are using wild respirator and couple of them are using N95. So that is very dangerous situation. And one of the hypothesis people made that in OT, all the surgeons and staffs are COVID negative, but uh, in Ahmedabad, we have seen surprises. Uh, in our hospital, we have seen two surprises in which one patient in which we have sent pre-operative RT-PCR uh, that is COVID testing. Uh, we have performed surgery as that test came negative, and after one day, uh, authority from laboratory came to us and said that there was a mistake. Another patient report came to us, and actually, your patient was positive. Then there was a lot of problems. So, I guess uh, we have to treat all patients as corona positive because eventually we will see more. Yeah, you're right. Dr. Nayak, a quick comment, please. <laughs> yes. Dr. Nayak, am I audible? Nayak is, Nayak is missing actually. I think he's lost his. Yeah, uh, Dr. Rajesh, yeah. Dr. Rajesh, what I feel, um, uh, we, we have tried four or five different, uh, including air purifier. We are only 60% efficient most of the time. And uh, I, I feel I am taking very high risk uh, in, in our hospital, especially when we are doing robotic and laparoscopy. Uh, sometimes uh, air leakage is there around the straight pores, uh, and suddenly some new sister comes and lets off the air. And when we are using the full face uh, uh, respirator, uh, uh, it's a repeated uh, uh, detection uh, problem and loss of movement. And sometimes I, I wear goggles over the, my specs and humidification and not able to see the structures properly. So I feel personally I am taking 60, uh, only 60% efficient and 100% or more than 100% risk doing these cases, don't know what modifications will come in the future. That's my first yeah. Now, Rajesh, can, can I add something? Yes, sir, please. So, so we, we've been discussing about the in-operation in room, prevention, protection, and everything. The same patients, we are discussing about universal prophylaxis. The same patient goes into an ICU where 24-hour care. Here, it's all controlled, two, three hours, one hour, five hours. There, again, the same PPEs to so many staff members are also extremely important. I have a 54-bed ICU. See, the, the biggest challenge is how to really supply PPEs and maintain a, yeah. maintain a channel this way and how expensive, how expensive it's going to become if you are doing a universal pro pro prophylaxis. You are absolutely right. In fact, I also try to review the literature. The literature does not suggest that the respirator is any more effective in filtering the virus than N95. The only advantage is that probably it reduces the work of breathing, and so that you can you can sustain the respirator and you can sustain with without a discomfort for a longer time. And one of the important uh, uh, you know uh, factor is that it is very categorically mentioned uh, with the uh, product, even with N95, that every single time you touch the mask and put it down onto the neck to breathe and put it up again, it is considered one doffing. And one mask should not last for more than five doffings. 
ideally and you are should you should ideally not be doffing the mask during every surgical procedure even once ideally so there are there are things which need to be understood and uh, discussed and probably with time we will have some evidence as and as we go uh, but that's been the typical uh, setting that we operate upon and here also you can see the anesthetists have a different set of head gears and the head shields and the N95 and on the top of that surgeon the surgeon the surgeons have these uh, respirators Okay, now just again, maybe uh, we have understood, we have heard so so as a, a very a, a prominent proponent of minimal access even during COVID, which is so good, which is so kind of encouraging for all of us. And at the same time, we have some reserved opinions regarding the race. So basically, it boils down to understanding whether the person, do you think? Are the laparoscopic outcomes superior enough to justify taking the unknown risk in the era of COVID-19? Or do you think the risk is not significant enough to justify sacrificing the advantages of minimal access cancer surgery? So can I have a quick, quick opinion, just one liner from everyone? Are the laparoscopic procedures good enough to not be afraid or are, do you think that the risk of COVID is not significant enough to get bothered? Dr. Saklani, please. Uh, hi, Rajesh. I think we are just overplaying it. Even for hepatitis patients and HIV, we are using MIS rather than open. So, I think it's Fomu showed in his last slide. So, the risk, test, so I think risk is not enough. The, I think the benefit is there. Less blood loss. There is no blood in the blood bank. Less pain and less morts death. And also the staff don't have to look after them. So, you have to look after staff as well. So the patient contact is there. So I think minimal access is justified. And Dr. Rao has already mentioned his opinion that not taking the yeah. precaution, which means the risk is not probably enough. That that's their uh, mindset and the thought process. Dr. Gowda? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we uh, uh, we are we are selected our cases and doing. For example, these guys low angle resections. These cases we are doing renal renal masses, uh, but thyroid, uh, colon, and stomach we are stopped. So we have segregated our cases That's uh, going to be my next question, and uh, doing robotic only rather than laparoscopy. Yeah. Dr. Pari, your comment. Is the risk less or is the benefit more? I guess benefit is more. Okay. So we have continued, we have not changed our indications, either for surgery or for approach. Right. Great. Dr. Rutha? Uh, 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 we are continuing with the uh, all types of surgery. And uh, recently, I operated a, a big sarcoma uh, involving the clavicle, uh, scapula, and the right uh, humerus. And uh, it took almost uh, six and a half hours along with the replacement. So, and there was a lot of uh, aerosoling from the uh, bone cutting, from the uh, bone cutters. So, probably so, you feel that the risk is not all that high. Yeah, no, no. Because uh, we are taking all the precautions okay. that we are doing, because there is no other way. The, uh, you just uh, have to intervene in the window period. If the window is lost, the patient goes to period. If the but that sarcoma is a different issue, because as it is, you would have done it open. I was talking yeah. to minimal access part. But then, uh, so when I was trying to read about it, and you know, the latest uh, article in the channel, they made a very good statement regarding whether to choose open or laparoscopic. And for every surgeon, in the absence of convincing data, this was just about four or five days, in the absence of convincing data, when both open and laparoscopic approaches are clinically as good and as appropriate, the safest approach may be the one that is familiar to the surgeon and which requires less operative time. So perhaps you, know, you produce the same results because you, you are used to something. And I'm sure all of us who are deep into laparoscopy for cancer, we realize that for a person who's into laparoscopy for something, say see a rectum all the time, it's open operation does not come all that easy to begin with the camera. Absolutely. I, I, I think Rajesh, uh, Sandeep is back. So, Sandeep is back. Okay, hi Sandeep, so you're back. Okay, so... Yes, I'm back. I had electrical issues, so I had to switch over and I can't come on uh, this thing. You know, video is not possible. Okay, thank God. If the electricity is back and we have the current back from you the, in the <coughs> webinar, so it we catch up with the excitement. And uh, as Dr. Devinder Parikh just mentioned, I try to think about the magnitude of the procedure every and representative of magnitude of the laparoscopic procedure that we routinely perform. 
So, would want to know from the panelists as to like start from staging laparoscopy, laparoscopic dissection for colonic cancer, then rectal cancer, then D2 gastrectomy, then thoracoscopic vasectomy, then laparoscopic pancreatic for liver dissection, then finally the cytodetective surgery. Are there any opinions that in the COVID era, I am not going to go beyond this level three or level four with laparoscope and wait for level five, six, and seven or something like that? Can I have a quick opinion from all of you, please? Doctor, starting from Dr. Saglani. Uh, I think I would recommend everything uh, apart from laparoscopic pancreas and hyper we cannot do because uh, the intensivist won't allow it. Other than that, I think everything should be quite okay. Dr. Rao? Yes, we have, we have done CRS, IPEC, th okay. three of them, okay. and we have done everything at the same way. So we have not changed anything. For okay. the patient, the patient gets the same thing that, that, that used to happen before January. Yes. That's a very encouraging comment. That's great. Yeah. So, Rudra? Yeah, same thing I, I was telling. But my point is, if uh, two senior surgeons are required to go in a case, don't agitate because uh, because if you do uh, the if the operative time is less, then everybody is going to benefit. So so that way, whenever required, we just in and finish the case early because uh, sometimes it benefits. Him. Okay, Dr. Parikh has already mentioned his point of view. Dr. Nayak, a good comment from you on this. Uh, yeah. So regarding uh, the high pack. We are not doing, we are not done hyper so far. In fact, we delayed a few of the cases which uh, were there. We put them back on chemotherapy. Uh, all the other surgeries we are doing, as far as thoracoscopy is concerned, in fact, it is very interesting. Uh, you know, when I, I was seeing another uh, Spanish surgeon discussing regarding this, he said, you know, a gasless thoracoscopy is much safer than going ahead with, uh, you know, open surgery because. You know, there is absolutely no aerosolization there because there is no gas coming out. So, in so, fact, I was trying to search the literature on this and I could find two articles of thoracoscopy in the COVID era and they were perfect regarding thoracoscopy and such. But one of the articles was actually doing the thoracoscopy with a non intubated patient. So non intubated? Non intubated patient without any positive pressure and under local anesthesia, they have done. Uh, probably a biopsy or something, and one pleuroscopy. Uh, pleuroscopy is they do, yeah. yeah. Yes, but for our procedures, it's not possible. So I am but sure. we don't have. I had, uh, yeah. Okay. I had one more comment regarding uh, the PPE because you know I think at that exact time my electricity problem started. See, we have designed uh, you know a head and neck cover, which is just like a monkey cap, which we tuck into our dress. And that covers the entire uh, neck, head, ear, everything, leaving out only the face. So, you know, uh, we use uh, the you know 3M respirators, but this monkey cap I think is quite uh, good, which we have done. We are calling it monkey cap. It is just like monkey cap. It works uh, wonderfully for you know covering your neck. Anybody who has done an MIE, uh, minimal invasive thoracoscopic is objective in the last, I believe Dr. Rao must have done it. Yeah. I have been, I've been doing it regularly. We have done a lot of robotic uh, esophagectomy. Uh, we are not changed any of them. In, in fact, uh, a well controlled, uh, you know, minimal access is better than an uncontrolled open surgery. You are bathing with fluid, you are using cautery non stop because I showed you in my presentation the use of cautery and the setting and uh, the amount required in uh, open surgery is far high and everything is open, everybody is taking. So, you know, it's a well controlled environment in MIS, and all you need to do is vent out through. But the only thing is, so, 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 uh, I think what sums up is what Rajesh told what you are used to is better you continue. Correct. And continue what you are used to. Sir, any comments, Professor Vijay Kumar, sir? No, I am only learning. <laughs> because <laughs> I'll tell you, I am so, serious about it. Because I am really confused. In a, in a teaching institution, too many people are putting their eyes, hands, everything. Yes. So and, oh, and that's going to and be. And you know the surgeons don't listen to anybody else. Yes. That's the problem. And yes. the anesthetists will not listen to the surgeons. Yes. 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 Like for example, uh, Dr. Subramanian has place where he says and the whole thing may listen, but that doesn't. No, sir. 
No, no sir, I'm, no, no, I'm just over, telling I'm too, many, also. too many people, too many opinions. And the most important thing I learned in the last two months is people work from their emotional point of view, not the rational point. Because not having anything, so they were anxious, apprehensive, and they, they, they thought what they are telling is right. So things were not at all under control, I would say. Yeah, so I'm going to address these That's very People are falling in line. And as you rightly said, they are going back to the January days. That's yeah. all is happening. So to even uh, convince my anesthetist, I am thinking, as, as I said, I was listening here to go and tell. Because as of today, in my setting, open surgeries are only going on and they were not willing. Anesthetists were not willing. They were worried so many things because uh, uh, the, the reports were caught in the beginning. And then, then they are now slowly going to staging and then moving on. But it is to take along a lot of team of people with different views and different ideas is probably a bigger challenge than going and operate. Okay. So, sure. I think the modification has already been covered by Dr. Sloan. And coming to an interplay with NSCT and NSCTRT, one comment from Dr. Saklani regarding the CA rectum, how you have changed and interplayed with NSCT and NSCTRT, and are you delaying surgeries based on that? And one comment from Dr. Rao regarding the esophagus and the same setting as I think the problem was uh, giving radiotherapy, get patients coming for this was a bit difficult. So because they didn't have transport. So the short, long course chemo radiation was changed to short course radiotherapy and four cycles of chemotherapy. Uh, now, if there are poor responders, we are operating now because there are fewer patients, otherwise we will give consolidation chemotherapy. Uh, we normally wait for eight to 12 weeks, uh, but that we continue the same thing. And have there been any patients who had already received, uh, say, NACT or NACTRT in January or February and were due for surgery and for some reasons, you eventually gave them definitive uh, chemo radiation and opted out of surgery, but there's a patient. No, no, no. I think all those who came, because we are still running a six to seven list per week, so we have never closed down. So we were mm -hmm. able to sort it out. We also have not changed the protocol. Surgery, when it is required, we are continuing. But regarding the esophagus, same protocols. So same. Nothing else. Every, everything, okay. the patient before January, patient now is the same. Okay. Dr. Gorda? Yeah, same. We are doing esophagus uh, rectum by the same protocol. We are not postponing or doing anything as anything. the previous protocol and we are even doing lung cases also it's not a problem okay, okay. all right dr pari only the waiting time we have made little alteration we following uh trt instead of you know doing at uh, probably seventh or eighth week we have seventh week some of the rectal cases and give also figures sixth week probably and now we need to uh, analyze those waiting for a longer time has got a better pathological response compared to the i think this is the ideal time to look back about five cases versus another five cases which has happened. I think this is the right time to, uh, you know, dig our results and also see that. The new research protocol. I have two two comments that uh, for MIE, uh, to doing esophagus by open approaches, I feel that it's not acceptable if you know how to do MIE. So, I personally don't believe in doing opening of the esophagus. First thing, second thing. Earlier we were doing esophagectomy in teams, so one of the surgeons were doing thoracic part, second surgeon was doing abdominal part. But now in the era of COVID, now we have segregated the team. So even if one person is exposed, not entire team will be non-functional. So now at, at present, in our team, we have uh, four senior surgeons in quarantine. So uh, uh, we have made a team that surgeon who is track the case will finish the case. And in that way, even if something went wrong, then only one person will be out of the worst. So that is what we have done. In fact, that's the part of most of the guidelines that changing of teams is perhaps not desirable. And what happened, and I'll just share you uh, share with you briefly our own experience. We had a suspected positive patient in the ward which was there with us for about five, six days, and eventually we found that it was uh, not operable. And everybody was exposed, including all the gastro physicians, so four of my associates, all the residents, and it was suspected positive. So the day when we thought that it was positive, somehow we realized that almost all of them, us were exposed. And had she been actually positive, we would have had to shut down the entire department. So this was about one and a half months back, so we decided. And now what we have done is, you know, like for example, in our unit, there are four consultants. So it is one consultant and three residents who make a team and they work for one week. And then next week, the next team takes over. And the moment there is somebody who gets exposed, 
the first thing goes into retirement in seven days and the next thing takes over like that. So it prevents mm -hmm. the, the entire department from getting exposure and it gives a more practical situation on the ground. Rajesh, uh, there is one most important uh, thing, you know, uh, which we approved in the committee in doing. The yes. moment a patient uh, gets in, uh, making a contact form, uh, yes. like a, a each me medical healthcare worker, workers, you know, not just doctors, sisters, everybody, when they see there is a sheet, you have to write what is your contact with that patient or what are the level of protection you are wearing. Because we know that uh, managing the patient with PPE, if that patient eventually becomes positive, you are not a primary contact as per ICMR. Yes. So every patient should have a contact form contact of each healthcare provider and when they contact the patient, say a sister managing or a doctor came for a cross medical or a surgeon operating anesthetist, what level of protection they are wearing. So yeah. suppose one patient turns out to be positive, you don't have to close the whole block, close one surgical department, whole anesthesia, you know the contact and they are primary contact for easy for quarantine. Yeah, absolutely agree with you. In fact, uh, this was because the government guidelines have been changing and in Rajasthan there are designated COVID negative and COVID positive hospitals and one and a half months back when it so happened there were guidelines for not doing an RT-PCR on everyone who got exposed. Just after this patient happened there was these guidelines and the moment we reported that this patient could be positive because one of the reports had actually come positive and we now know that an imp inappropriate that was the time when our institution was not doing the RT-PCR. So it was done at some other center and it was reported positive and it is it is a well-known fact and an established fact that if during the testing, the quality is not maintained in testing in terms of uh, transporting the sample and uh, managing the calibration, etc., false positives can be because of a poor quality control at the testing facility. So if this patient then uh, eventually turned out negative on two subsequent testings, uh, but then now there is a guideline that if there is an exposure, it's very easy. You do either a serology or an rt scan and quarantine based on that. And the, of course, I understand, uh, ICMR has also defined the level of contact, which gives you the level of risk of having the COVID contact. Right? Okay. Uh, the same question as Professor Vijay Kumar sir was saying. So what's the role of NSRS? Has the role of NSRS changed? Who has become the leader of the theater now? Have the checklist changed? and who affects the decision. Have there been any patients who have been changed because the anesthetist was not willing or kind of had a different opinion on the patient? Dr. Nayak, is he there? Okay, I think Dr. Nayak, he has some problems with connection. He's there. I'm there. I'm there. He, he has some problem with his anesthetist, I think. Anesthetist <laughs> 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 probably more than virus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, our anesthetist department is quite good that way. In fact, uh, the head of the anesthesia uh, puts all the protocols is in the COVID committee also. And uh, in fact, initially in the period when the you know there was lockdown one, uh, uh, of course most of the things were shut. But uh, you know we did a few cases uh, which were emergency, but otherwise most of it was shut. But in the lockdown two onwards, everything actually goes back to normal. And in fact, they took the lead and telling us that you know we are willing start your elective work. We are okay with that. That's how it is. Nayak's life is a mess. Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't <laughs> work with me, sir. No, she does not work with me. <laughs> it's so difficult to work with life. Okay, so great. So, uh, in, yeah. fact, uh, in fact, uh, what has happened in uh, the high incidence areas, particularly in the US and uh, places like Austin, <laughs> What they've done is you know, they've formed committees wherein there are representatives yes. every discipline, be it surgeon, anesthetist, gastroenterologist, interventional radiologist, radiotherapist, oncologist, everyone. And every single case goes through that team which tries to identify which is the best course forward in view of the prevalence of COVID in their area and region and the availability of the alternative modality of treatment which can suit the patient as well as the surgery. And, uh, despite the fact and, and they are trying to avoid surgery wherever possible. Okay, so we have already, I think, uh, discussed this. As Sir was mentioning, how has the surgical learning for juniors changed? I think these juniors who have some very important years in their career for training and learning, they have a major concern that they might actually lose out on their training for the next six months or one year 
just because COVID is there, the volume is less, the protocols have changed, they might not get their hands upon operating the patient because you want to put up to operate upon them in the smallest possible time without any glitches during this procedure. Can I have a quick comment from you, sir? First, Professor Vijay Kumar, sir. This, this, is, this is a very major issue if you ask me in a teaching institution like ours, yes. particularly any teaching institute, yeah. because we are now worried whether we give it to the juniors, if they get affected, I'll feel guilty that uh, COVID they has become COVID positive because I allowed him to do. On the other hand, if I don't give, you'll not learn the subject, learn uh, hands-on training. So this is the balance probably you'll have to take. And most of the time, we'll hold. In fact, that my, 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 my institute was closed, OT was closed for elective for some time in the first lockdown, then it was open. The first surgery was done by me, Whipples. I said I will go and do surgery first so that it will induce enthusiasm and the fear will go out and then we started doing, I thought. That's what I did. And my, my team is now doing, everybody is doing. Great leadership. Dr. Saklani. Uh, I think uh, because of the rota, one week on and off, they are very limited exposure and with limited theatre time and all. So I think it's mainly the fellows and consultants who are unfortunately. Uh, they are going to do so. Uh, there's very little we can do for them. Correct. Correct. I, I agree with you. Dr. Rao? Yes, uh, similar. I think it would affect things. It has affected Olympics. It has affected lots of things. So uh, it would affect their training a little bit. There's no doubt about it. And is, there, what is, happening. is there any way we can compensate for that? Maybe through video lectures, video demonstrations, discussions in house? Uh, all that is happening. All, uh, we, Based uh, programs have got es escalated to a level wherein there is there is a different type of learning that is happening. So yes. we, are, we are glad we have explored lots of other avenues actually. So there is a lot of been lot of been lot of good that has happened because of this. Yeah, yes. we, have, we have actually realized that there could be many good forms of training and teaching. Correct. Well. Correct. Correct. Soam, your comment, please. In my hospital, not much uh, has got affected because uh, when I post a surgery, I sort of clearly know uh, my fellows and students at what level of training are they and what they can independently do. So I allot in such a way uh, that the team allotted would just finish it off without having to call me or my other colleague to come. Uh, but I think two to three months is too small because I would say 80% they are doing the same training what it was pre-COVID. It will get compensated because training is not just three to four months. It's uh, for three years with us in my department. So marginally down, but uh, I don't think it, it, it didn't matter much in our office. Dr. Nye? We have, uh, you know, minimal access fellows, surgical oncology fellows. Yes, it does affect, I think, you know, some of the cases they would have done, but, you know, now only seniors are washing up. Uh, so. You know, only three of us, uh, the seniors in the team are washing. They only get to assist and it is a concern. But I think, you know, if uh, let's hope the situations improve and we are able to give them more hands-on a uh, little later. But yeah. yes, three months they will lose, definitely. Yeah. Okay, this Sorry, th things won't improve. We will only get, we will only readjust. Correct. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, my my maybe side something. of uh, Darwin yeah. and adaptability. Yeah. Okay. Virus will not adapt. We have to adapt. Yeah. yeah, let's see how we adapt. We are looking at a fast recovery of the patient without having any complication in the intra and post op. And probably, and uh, you know, we are looking at that same surgeon who has done the repeated work. Probably, you know, le let us continue and finish it up. Probably, rest of the surgery, the later half of the surgery, like closure and other things, would be given to the our fellows and residents. Yeah. So that's how we are continuing and uh, making the work. To in fact, the guidelines obviously they, they are you know, kind of entering their training because you know it is the one surgeon who's operating. We want minimum traffic in the overs. We are don't we don't want any observers to stand there and see. And so obviously it's affecting. And perhaps it is the junior most training. Say you know if you have an MCH program, it is not the third year, it is the first year or the second year subject all. I also realize, but I think we need to find out some innovative ways to compensate for their training. And uh, probably in and, the and Rajesh, on that count, I think minimal access scores over open because you can record and show it to them later on. Correct. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. COVID nineteen has posed some 
new issues which kind of challenge our pre-existing uh, notion of ethics for a surgeon. If you get an obstructed CA, say left colon, with inadequate PPE, should you operate, should you not operate? Dr. Saklani? Uh, no, no, I think it's our, our first duty to the patient. So you have to operate. Hopefully, you'll have adequate PP. But then you can cut down the magnitude of surgery. So you may just come out with stoma or something if you don't have PP. If you have adequate PP, then do the perfect job. Dr. I think the same, The you know, most of the time, uh, you know, all these patients are uh, having a small structurous lesion in the sigmoid colon and the surgery is the form of the treatment. I think all these patients, uh, irrespective of either open or MIS, probably the surgery has to be done. But uh, since uh, we have passed that phase, we are already using the PPE. I think it's the right move to, uh, you know, start using the PPE and start doing the RT-PCR for every patient. I, I, I agree with you. In fact, this uh, issue was much more there in the beginning, say one, one and a half months back, when there, is, when there was a shortage for PPEs and the entire world was struggling for PPEs and there was this big ethical question whether to kind of treat and uh, uh, kind of involve and indulge yourself with the patient without that adequate PPE. So the second important ethical question is, uh, if it is a non-urgent operation, patient has an unknown COVID status, your government is not allowing you to do the RT-PCR, you have enough and adequate PPPs, the patient is consenting for surgery, but despite that, you might have on one ground or the other. Say, for example, if you say that your staff is not well trained, or if you do not have isolating facilities, that your ICU may not have the adequate equipment, etc., etc. So these two things have actually kind of changed the ethics. So what has happened is, of it, there has been a shift of focus from trying to benefit our individual patients to focusing on the benefit of the community. So at times, the benefit of the community is taking preference over benefit of the patient because if you have only, say, three surgeons in that hospital who can deal with that and the entire maybe uh, big district, uh, you might not want to expose yourself because you have to serve the community at large. And second is, there is a greater shift and there is a greater level of paternalism that we have been used to in previous decades. So despite everything, earlier on if the patient was consenting, you did not have the right to refuse a patient based on some other grounds. But now the decision making is much more on the surgeon. I think that brings uh, to the end of the kind of relevant questions on the ground that we had. Thank you all very much for participating. And now I think we can take questions from Dr. Rudra, which he has gathered through the chat. Thank you all very much for being here.